Hey, hey, Midway. Hey, it's great to be in the house with you today. Welcome to all of you here. This is a good looking group. Look at your neighbor. Tell them you look good today, man. Yeah, and welcome to all of you tuning in all over the place, screens all over the world. We are so glad to have all of you here. It is a very special day today, and for many of you, uh, congratulations are in order, because for many of you, you made it through the first week of school. Yeah, give yourselves a hand. Let's celebrate that. Absolutely. And for the rest of you, uh, it's coming. Your time is coming. School kicks off this week, next week. And so congratulations to all of you. Today's really just such a special day, a monumental day as we go into a new season together uh, as a church. It's a new season as we go into August. By the way, it is the first Sunday of August. Can you believe it? It is here, man. We are going into it together, and it's a monumental day because it is my first opportunity to have just the absolute honor to preach to you an entire sermon for the first time uh, as co-pastor here at Midway, and so I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Just a special, special day. I'm overjoyed to be able to pastor lead and love each of you as we get to follow Jesus together. I'm honored to stand with uh, my co-pastor, my dear friend, uh, Todd Wright. He's been a pastor to me for a long, long time, and I'm so thankful for him, thankful for our journey we go on together, and I am thankful for you. More than anything, I'm thankful for Jesus, because it's all for his glory. We're going to lift his name high together, and many of you, we go way, way back. Some of you, like me, you look a little older than the last time we shared today, like today, but many of us, we just met, and for the sake of all of us, if I can, I would love to just share my heart with you for a few minutes before we kick off into beyond and this focus we'll have for these couple of weeks, and I want to share a few things about expectations. First of all, what can you expect from me? I want you to hold me accountable, expect some things from me, know who I am, and first thing I'd like for you to know is I promise you as we go on this journey together, I'm going to relentlessly pursue Jesus. That's true as a follower of Jesus, first and foremost, as a husband, as a father, as a pastor, as a leader, as a friend, in every way. I just want to run after Jesus with all that I've got, and we get to do that together. I also will relentlessly run after the vision that God has for us and our future, because I don't take that lightly. It's God who gives vision. It's God's church. Midway is God's church. It's not my church or your church. It is God's church, and we want to pursue his vision for us together. So you can expect that. You can expect for me to do it with unconditional love and grace. Uh, I'm human. I'll make mistakes. I'll require unconditional love and grace, but I'll also give it out freely. And we're all called to do just that. Uh, I would also commit to you and, and tell you, you can expect from me boldness to stand for the truth of God's word and for the gospel and to do it with grace because we're called to look like our founder, Jesus, who embodied all of the fullness of grace and truth, and we will do that together. So those are my commitments. And I'd also ask a few things of you uh, as we go on the journey. I'd ask you to love my family. Um, You have loved my family so well, and I'm so thankful for the journey we've already had. Many of you have loved my family for a long, long time. And I see faces like that right now in the room, and I'm very, very thankful for you. They have relentlessly followed God's call and gone with me and supported me, and we've done it together. And so just love them as you have, as you will, as you are. Love my family. And I would also ask you to allow God to stretch you, to allow God to open your heart to new things, to stretch and to grow and to let God do something in you that's beyond what he's already done. He wants to do more. He wants to continue to grow us. Change will be a part of our journey because as God changes us, things around us change and we affect change. And I view change really, it's really an exchange. Change is an exchange. We exchange one thing, usually something maybe more comfortable for something that makes us more effective for the gospel, something that's more profitable for the kingdom of God or something that God is doing in us. And it's been said that the only person that likes change is a wet baby. I think that's pretty true, but I'll tell you, I've changed some diapers in my time and they even scream at you when you do that sometimes, right? You may know that journey as well. John Maxwell, I think, was the first to ever say this statement that's so true. He says, change is inevitable, but growth is optional. I say, let's choose growth. 
in the midst of a changing world, and let's grow and change together. So I'd ask you to be patient with me as we get to know each other, learn, stretch, grow beyond together. And lastly, I would ask you to do what one of our core values states, and that is fight for unity. In a world that's so divided, let's fight for unity. Let's be the family that God intends, the family that Jesus was building when he said, I will build my church, and even the gates of hell won't prevail against it. So I would ask those things of you, and I wanna thank you because you've really embodied that already. We started our journey together in some ways back on the 175th anniversary, and I had been praying for a while, just asking God, what could we do to lead into August where it's not just this boom, let's get it started kind of a thing, and God put on my heart this this heavy ask and call for us to go into a 21-day season of prayer and fasting. I know many of you are in the room right now or you're watching us online and you're new with us. You should know that we've been in that season as a church. It actually culminates today. And I've been hearing stories of of fasting where people fasted from things like news or or social media or digital anythings or television in general or definitely foods. I did some foods things and I don't know about you, but I'm kind of ready for tomorrow. (laughs) But I want to thank you for leaning in, for praying for fasting. Many of you've allowed me the privilege to have just a small little snippet of your day through the writings of our 21-day devotional, and I want to thank you for doing that. And if you don't know what that is, you can find it on our website, or if you want to catch up, go to midwaychurch.com. There's a devotional link that'll pop up on that homepage. Click it, and it's got some devotionals that capture a little bit of this journey to beyond that I know God has us on as a church. And With that, I'll tell you that beyond is a word that God's been stirring in my heart and my soul deeply for actually a number of years now. But specifically, God has taken that word and stirred it deeply in my heart about our future together as Midway Church, as the body of Christ here at Midway, because we're so blessed. Aren't we blessed? We are a blessed church. We have over 175 years of amazing history. We stand on the shoulders of amazing leaders, pastors, and people who have made a difference and stitched their name into the fabric, not just of quilts, if you remember the 175th anniversary, but into the fabric of the foundation that we now sit in and get to build on today. We're blessed. And when we're blessed, the tendency, if you're like me, and I think we're all pretty human in this room, and all of us watching right now, is to turn inward to protect what we have, and to coast and get comfortable. But God didn't call us to coast. A mentor of mine often taught me, you can only coast go in one direction and it's downhill. And so we're not called to coast, we're called to go beyond. And so it's a word that I know God has for us in this season and it represents, and I've been asked many times, what does it represent? Is it it a new building? Is it a new ministry? Is it a new idea? Is it a new philosophy? What, What does it mean? And I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna be real vulnerable and tell you, I don't really know right now. I know what God wants to build in us so that he can do something through us. And I know that this mindset is gonna lead to next steps as we go. And that's the beauty of the journey of being God's church is we get to follow him together as a family. And I just love that. I need you. You need me. This is all I got. Sorry. You need your neighbor. We need each other. And we're gonna go on that journey together. But beyond, I'll tell you what it is. It represents a mindset that I know God wants to build in us that's gonna serve as the foundations on which the future of Midway and the future of your journey and my journey and our journey together will be built. That's what God is wanting to build inside of us now. And I wanna explore it with you for two weeks and just give you some mindsets. And these four things I'm gonna share with you over the course of two weeks will actually coincide with the first four days of our Beyond Devotional, the 21-day devotional that we've jumped into together. So I believe these two weeks will be monumental. I believe that we'll look back and remember this season as we see what God does beyond our wildest dreams. And we'll look back on these days. So be in the house. If you can't, join us online. Make sure you're with us and we'll dig in together. So my challenge to you is go on this journey with me as I share with you what God's stirring in me for us. And you may notice we had a new tool on the screen today. I've gotten accustomed to using one of these and I wanted to use every tool to share some of this with you today. And I'll start by sharing a verse. We'll be later in second. Corinthians chapter number five. You can find your place there. But as you find your place there, I want to take you to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter three, 
in verse 20. Paul wrote this, and he wrote this to the church at Ephesus. Read it from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. He said, now to him who is able to do above and, read this part with me, above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. That, my friends, is exactly what God wants to do in your life. That is what God wants to do in our church body. And I don't know what barriers God may need to break through for you, for me, for us to do it, but he is able. And notice that it's his work. It's not my work. According to the power of how hard we work and put effort forth. Is that what it says? According to the power that works in you. And that power is the spirit of God, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. I'd say we're in pretty good shape. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond. And I want to take you on a journey of a, a mental exercise. Uh, number one would be try to memorize this verse. Not right now, over the course of these next couple of weeks, commit it to memory. It's like, dude, you just took us on like 21 days of prayer and fasting and writing done. You're making me memorize scripture. Like, let's dig in together. Memorize this verse. But here's another one. I want to show you a picture of a telescope uh, image. How many of you have seen these recent NASA web telescopes? images. They're, they're fascinating. And there's skeptics out there. Maybe you're one of them. Maybe I should be too. Like, are they real, all these things? I don't know. But I, I'll tell you what happened with me. I looked at this and the little circular pieces that you see in there, you see them? They're all over. There's thousands of what are believed to be galaxies. And for me, as, and look it up, NASA Webb Telescope. There's a bunch of other ones. It'll blow your mind. That's what happened with me. As I looked at these images I really saw God do something in me that obliterated <laughs> the boundaries of my imagination about where we live, about our universe, about the world, about God's creation, about what God has done, about what God is doing, but particularly about what God wants to do in me, in you, and in and through us. And let that image, let the creation of God remind you of how powerful he truly is. So let's turn to 2 Corinthians, shall we? You ready for the word today? If you are, give somebody a fist bump, a high five. We're gonna dig in to the word of God. We've been studying First and Second Thessalonians as a church for a couple of months here. And Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica. And as he wrote to the church at Thessalonica, it's clear to see that they were an exemplary church. And I like to think of us as an exemplary church. Can I get an amen? You like to think of that too? Yeah, me too. I, like, I want to be that kind of church. He also wrote this passage, and it's a letter that he wrote to the church at Corinth. Now, if Thessalonica had exemplary churches, Corinth was, well, not so exemplary. They had all kinds of issues. And even though I like to think of us as a Thessalonica church, I'm convinced, because I know me and I've been around people, that we all have Corinthian kind of moments. You know what I'm talking about? You ever have Corinthian moments where you just turn into the knucklehead that Paul is writing to? And he gives them a challenge to think beyond what I'll call four things here. And we're going to spend two weeks looking at these four mindsets, these four foundations for our future today as he wrote to them. The same Paul that wrote to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians 3.20, that wrote to the church at Thessalonica, wrote this to the church at Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, we will start in verse 14 and read through verse 17 today. He says, for the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. All, that those who live may no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. I love those verses so much. And our shirts and on the wall where we do baptisms, we had a baptism earlier today and we showed a video of a little fellow when he came to know Christ. He was with his camp buddies and he danced. He just couldn't contain it. He got up and danced. I mean, that's the kind of joy that comes with being a new creation. And may we never get tired of those new creation moments. But the theology and the vision the thoughts beyond that Paul gives surrounding that part of the passage that may sound familiar to you are astounding. So let's explore two of them today, two next week. Number one, write this down, verses 14 and 15, we see beyond myself. 
beyond myself. Now, you've got one of those. I've got one of those. I found that I am the hardest person that I have ever or will ever lead. (laughs) You are the hardest person you're ever going to lead. And a journey to what God has for us way above and beyond what we could ask, think, or imagine. We'll start with God leading you beyond the self component. These verses, verses 14 and 15, are identity verses. It's about who we are, not just about what we do. And in verse 14, we see that it's the love of Jesus that compels us, or the version we just read says controls us, controls us. Us. And as we're looking at these words, as you think about these verses, I want to remind you today that the love of Jesus changes everything. The love of Jesus changes everything. <laughs> when you really grasp it, and if you hear nothing else today from the Lord in our time together, I pray that you can truly walk into a deeper understanding of the love of Jesus. And maybe God sent me in your life today just to tell you one thing, and that is that God loves you deeply. And his love changes everything. The word that's used here is controls. And it could be translated a few different ways in its original language. A few of them, controls, compels, uh, constrains, or even consumes. I like the word compel uh, because it makes me think of propel. If it compels me, it propels me. A propeller in a boat is what makes it move forward. So what makes you tick? What drives you in your life? That's the kind of verbiage that's being used here. And it's supposed to be the love of Christ. But I ask you, here's a couple of words for you to think about. Complimentary, complimentary, and compelling. And I ask you today, in your life, is the love of Jesus complimentary in that it is an addition to thing? You ever felt like faith kind of becomes a tack on in your life? You know, I've got my life, I've got my career, I've got my identity and the love of God, you know, it it comes in and it changes things, but it's almost like an add on. I'm gonna go to church and I'm gonna find a life group and it gets added on, it's complimentary. If you change the the letter E in the middle here to I, it's complimentary in the sense of like it's a complimentary or free item. You know, and I like that because the love of Jesus is free, but Jesus didn't just give us his love for free so that it could become complimentary. He gave it to us so that it would become compelling, that it would propel us forward, that it would constrain, consume us to the point that it doesn't just become something that's added to our life, but instead becomes something that is our life. Our whole life is built around the love of Jesus. It's like, wow. That's a, that word packs a big punch, doesn't it? So I ask you, is the love of Jesus compelling or is it just complimentary? It's a good question that we can all ask and it really leads us into the difference in believing and following. Now, we don't believe on the Lord Jesus unless we're, we hear and we don't hear without a preacher. Paul writes about those things and we have these moments where we believe in Jesus and we enter from death to life. The spirit of God indwells us, but Jesus didn't just say, good, you're set. We believe so that we can enter into the family of God. And then Jesus says, now take up your cross and follow me. And we're called to go from believing to following. And this is the difference here. The love of Jesus is just a complimentary thing sometimes. And you can believe. And I remind you, even the devil himself believes. Even the devil himself believes. But we're called to go from belief to actually following. And we get it so mixed up. Any recovering Pharisees in the room? I am, for sure. Because here's what pharisaical, legalistic faith looks like. We say that the behavior's gotta come first before you're even fit enough to believe. And man, if that's the case, we are all doomed. We have no hope if that is the case. And that's what legalism does is it says, I gotta look the part, I gotta get the, belief, the, the behavior part right before I can believe and then I can be fit enough to come into the family of God and, and I'm kept saved or whatever it may look like in your version of how that looks. It turns into that I've gotta behave, I've gotta meet a standard and I wanna remind us all today that as we go beyond self, it starts with the realization that I am such a sinner that I am dead. Have you ever tried to revive something that's dead? If it's dead, it's gone. It's over. It was finished for us, but God sent forth his son. That is the power of the gospel. That is the love of Christ that compels us, that I was dead in my trespasses and sins, but God sent Jesus and he breathed life into what was dead. And now I was dead, but I am alive. I was lost, but now I am found. That's the love that Paul is writing about. That's the love that 
We're called to be compelled and driven by. And he says it this way, as we go from this believing to now following, we no longer live for self, but we live for our Savior. He died for all so that we could die to ourselves and no longer live for ourselves. Paul says it this way as well in Philippians, Philippians 2, 3. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 says this, do nothing. How many, how many things do Nothing, nothing we do. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. Powerful verses that are really hard to live out. It's one thing to read it and say amen on a Sunday, but then that person shows up <laughs> in your life, at school, at work, at church. Uh-oh, they come to church sometimes with you, don't you? That person and they make this verse really hard to live out. And in our devotionals, I heard from many that it was the first time you'd heard this formula for joy that I had written out and given to you. I want to give it to you today. It's J-O-Y. Maybe you've heard it before. Don't even know who came up with this, but it's so powerful. Joy. This is a formula for joy. Jesus, others, yourself. That's the formula for joy. It's only when self goes last that joy actually lasts. And that's so counterintuitive, isn't it? I want to put me first, but try to spell joy with yourself first. Yaj, or you, you, I don't know. You, it's, you can't do it. You can't put the pieces together. But when Jesus is first, then others go second, and then it's yourself. Then it's me. Then I really start to live out, look like Jesus, the one who said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. <laughs> He who is last among you will be the greatest, will be first. What a story for us to hold on to and try to live out. And I want to tell you a little bit about myself as we're talking about going beyond myself. A little bit about me. Three things that made me who I was back in the day. I remember I was 17 years old and I was at Heard County High School. Any Heard County people in the room? All right, all right. <laughs> I had three things that really made up my identity, myself. I didn't really like two of them. And I really liked one of them. I'll give you the two I didn't like. One was work. I had a good sermon last Sunday on the theology of work, by the way. Work is good. God has given it to us to lean into. But I didn't really feel that way at 17 years old. For all of my summers, my family owned a pool business. And I remember the days we put the bottoms in the pool and it was so hot and you'd be drenched before you even carried one bucket. Started when I was a little kid and I could carry one bucket with two hands and it was only halfway full. And then I progressed and could put one bucket in each hand and I worked. And so work was a big part of who I was. And I didn't like it then very much. I didn't like my granddad and dad for that. Now I look back and I'm so thankful for the work ethic that was instilled in me. So work, I didn't really like that one. I didn't like the second one very much either. Teachers and educators, I'm sorry. I'm just, I was that guy. I didn't like school. That was the second one. I just didn't like it. I mean, kids that are watching, I loved it. You should too, right? But I was that kid. I just didn't like being at school, but school was a big part of my life. But number three, it was the, it was the one. It was my number one and it was baseball. I was a baseball kid. I dreamed of being out there, lacing up my cleats and running out onto a major league baseball field one day. And I played ball with these, these guys since I was just a little rec league kid. And we had won some good tournaments, had a really good team. And I was going into my senior year. And this is the year you build up to. We had great coaches. We had some, some scouting people that were coming. Probably could have had some opportunities. I was a pitcher. I wanted to pitch in college and could have had some maybe opportunities to get a scholarship or two at some you know, colleges around. And it was so exciting to me to go into my senior year until, until God decided to do something in my spirit that I did not see coming. Those three things, I work, school, baseball. And then Jessica came onto the scene too, and that was, then she went to number one for sure. And by the way, if you see her, I, I'm convinced what got our relationship going, we were high school sweethearts, it was the uniform, <laughs> baseball uniform. She disagrees. We have different versions of the story, you know, I mean, whatever. But God showed up <laughs> as I was putting that baseball uniform on, preparing for the spring. And in my spirit, I felt miserable every time I thought about playing baseball, which had never happened to me. And I can't explain why other than I knew in my spirit, I was a 17 year old kid now, I was not supposed to play baseball my senior year of high school and forfeit everything. So I asked God why, you ever ask God why? Yeah, we used to have preachers would say, you know, you can't ask God why. And I've just learned, I already am asking it in my heart anyway and he knows my heart, so I might as well just vocalize what's in my heart that he already knows is there to begin with. So there you go, you're welcome. Some of you changed your prayer life today. But I cried out and asked God why, and he didn't tell me. 
I just knew, I was miserable, guys. I just knew I didn't need to play baseball. So I, I very reluctantly, after arguing, I took the step and I said, okay, I'm not gonna play baseball. Trader of the year. <laughs> I had to tell all of my buddies and the coach and they were like, why? And I just looked at them and said, all I can tell you is I just think God doesn't want me to play. He told me not to. <laughs> can you imagine being me in those moments? And it wasn't until after that that, you can see where this story is going, right? I didn't know why, but it was later that year, and I'm gonna tell you a little more of that story next week, that God called me to preach. And it was then that I learned something that changed my life from the baseball cleats to this realization. And here it is, write this down, that God often simplifies before he clarifies. Remember, this was a core component of who I was. It was work, it was school, it was baseball. But sometimes God will simplify things. Sometimes God will even take things away. Sometimes God will even use things that maybe got taken away to pare things down, to simplify things in your life before he clarifies your next step. And maybe you have lost someone. Maybe you have gone through a terrible season in your life where you just feel like it's loss after loss. And I wanna remind you today that God even takes the things that are done to us, the things that we do ourselves and to ruin things in our own lives, and he'll build on those problems, those losses, those griefs, those pains, those hurts, those hangups, and he will build something that becomes a platform for his promises, for his purposes, for his plans to come about in our life. As those things got stripped away from myself, I found myself being taken on a journey beyond myself beyond myself to a simplified version of life where I'm saying, okay, well, what do you want then? And then he clarified in that order. Now, if you're like me, I'm like, you need to reverse the order though, God. Clarify, and then it'll make it easier to simplify. Can I get an amen? Yeah, but that's not how God works many times. Sometimes he simplifies before he clarifies, and it takes us beyond self, and God is making you into something new as he transforms yourself today as well. That's number one. That's verses 16 and 17, though, is this newness, and that is number two, and that's beyond my past. Not just beyond myself, but beyond my past. Verses 16 and 17 are so powerful. Before we get to the new creation verse of 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you can't miss... Verse 16, where he says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. It changes how I see him. You notice that we regarded Christ according to the flesh. It's how we see Jesus. But then at, at the beginning of the verse, notice, I don't regard anyone according to the flesh. That's them. You got a them in your life too. It's the one we were talking about earlier. Sometimes they even show up to church with you. The them that maybe drives you nuts sometimes in your life. You might be related to them. But when you meet Jesus and the love of Christ compels and controls and constrains and consumes you, you see him differently and you even see them differently. And in that mix, you will end up seeing yourself differently. And in fact, a lot of times it starts there. You see him in such a way that changes how you see you, and then it changes how you see the world around you. So when we talk about the past, that's a very personal thing. Talking about yourself and your past, it's like, wow, pastor, first Sunday, why don't we get really personal on day one, right? But this is what Paul is writing about, and I pray that it can get into your heart. And I'd ask you, when it comes to your past, what's something that you just rather get beyond? Maybe it's COVID. Maybe it's this last year. Maybe it's the last two years. Maybe it's a relationship issue, maybe it's an addiction, maybe it's a sin, a problem, a hurt, a habit, a hang up. What is it that you wanna get beyond? What do you wanna leave in the past? You ever have any of those moments where it's like, I just hope I can leave this one behind and forget it and I hope nobody else remembers it either? You ever have those moments? <laughs> well, I can remember, God had called me to preach after that baseball story. He called me to preach and I found myself a year later a youth pastor I started as a youth pastor at the age of 17. Yeah, I imagine that. And then I'm 18, and I remember the church. It had the red, maroonish kind of pews there, and it was youth Sundays. I remember the smell. I remember the mural that was painted back there of the waterfall, and I can just feel the room that God put me in, and I wanted to be a good youth pastor. We've got some good youth pastors here at Midway, but some of them, y'all, you met some of them, them, 
Youth pastors, they're the ones that like, they, they're the ones that mess everything up. And I'm like, I don't want to be that guy. I'm preaching and we're, Jessica and I had what we call a bus ministry. We had a little Nissan Altima four-door car and we called it our bus ministry. And we just drive for two, three hours picking kids up and we'd lead them to Jesus and we were baptizing them on youth Sundays. And sometimes youth Sunday would coincide with the business meetings of the church. And that was always fun. But I remember preaching one time about Abraham. We had an Abraham series here recently and preaching on Abraham and how he was called by God to sacrifice his son Isaac. Maybe you remember that story. And in the story, there's a key moment where Abraham has lifted the knife, ready to sacrifice his son, not knowing what God was doing in his life. Why would you ask me to do this? This was a son of promise. That's a whole other sermon. But he lifted the knife, and there's a part of Scripture that says, but the angel of the Lord appeared. And I wanted to highlight that moment. So in my 18-year-old self, the, the youth were sitting over on this side. I can still remember it. Some of the older, more mature members maybe on the other side, and they filled up that section. I stepped forward right in the middle with all of the energy that my little 18-year-old preaching self could muster. I said, I wanted to highlight these but the angel of the Lord moments that showed up. And I said, don't you know, Isaac sure was glad to see that but. That was one of my moments. I'd just soon leave in the past. And the youth are over here, and they go, you know. And I'm like, stop it, you know. And then I'm getting the look on the other side of the congregation like, he's that youth pastor. Yeah, I, I still remember it. Moments like that are in your past, and some of yours aren't quite as funny as that one. Maybe they're way more serious. You've got skeletons, things in your past that you would just assume forget. And I love, I love verse 16. The first three words of verse 16, circle them, underline them, highlight them. Here they are, from now on. Our God is a from now on kind of God. He is a what will be kind of God. He is the kind of God who takes us from death to life, from being lost to being found. He is a what can be a beyond kind of God. That's our God that we serve. So whatever you brought in today that's in your past that you want to let go of, God says from now on because he changes everything. The moment Jesus steps into your life, it compels you in a way that makes you, verse 17, the new creation. So why would I remain consumed by my past? Why would I remain consumed by a past that Jesus has already paid it all to overcome? Yet we do that sometimes, don't we? We remain consumed by things in our past that Jesus has already conquered, that Jesus has already overcome. We all have a past. We confirmed that earlier. So what is it in yours? And I'll ask you this question today to make it very personal. I'll ask you, what is the enemy? What is the enemy using to shame, condemn, distract me from all the new God desires to do? It's a personal question, and I would challenge you between you and the Lord, answer that. What is it that the enemy is using to shame and distract, to condemn you, to keep you sidelined from the new that God desires to do. And I wanna remind you today that God does desire to do something new inside of you, through you. He is not finished with you. Have you read this before? You read about some of the people in here? I mean, people that just were murderers, adulterers. They're way too old, way past their prime, and God did the greatest things through them in their worst, weakest moments, at their oldest ages. So don't tell me that God's through with you. He wants to do something. No matter what your past may hold, he's got a future for you. Here's the part of the verse that I want us to grab hold of and take home this week. It's this, the new has come. The new has come. The old things are gone. The new has come. That's the end of verse 17. We are a new creation because of Jesus Christ. And God is ready for you. Don't miss this. God is ready to take you beyond your past. And to, he's a master story writer. He's so good at writing stories. Our story is one that only he could write. God's ready to write a story to take you to the next chapter beyond things in your past that the enemy's using to hold you up, to pull you back, to distract you from the future he has for you. And he wants to write a future only he can write. He wants to write a future for our church that only he can write. He wants to take us beyond where we are, beyond coasting to doing things, reaching West Georgia, seeing people who are far from God, but maybe they're close to us. I ask you that, who is far from God but close to you? You got somebody like that? They need you. God's ready to lead you into being a light in their life that's beyond yourself and beyond your past. 
Isaiah 43 is a verse, uh, 43, 18 and 19, if you want to write it down, is a couple of verses that God stirred in mine and Jessica's heart. It was repetitively seen in our life, our devotions, our study of his word, before he moved us from Georgia to Indiana. And he used it again, even as he called us back here to you. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19 just simply says, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? That word doesn't just mean see, it means to embrace. It means to like let it in, totally let it in. I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. That's the God that we serve. And because of that, here's a statement that can represent your life. The statement that I challenge you to take beyond your past into tomorrow with you is this statement. The past will refine me, but it won't define me. My past will refine me, yes, but it will no longer define who I am. I walk through those things, but I am his masterpiece. I am his child. I am his son. I am his daughter. My past is a part of what I experienced, but it is no longer going to be who I am. And I'm not gonna be deceived by that lie anymore. What a great prayer for us to use as we go into this next week. Because I found this, that sometimes we give other people or even things in our past, naming rights in our life, the labels you end up carrying. I found that the labels, when I end up carrying labels from my past, all it does is dictate my future. And I get constrained and consumed and compelled by a lie. But the truth is, if I know Jesus, I'm a new creation. I'm moving into the beyond, beyond myself, to the new creation God's made me, beyond my past, to the great future God has for me. Because look at this car. Look at this image here. This is a picture of a car. And you notice there's two things. that There's a windshield. There's also a rear view mirror. But which is bigger? You ever notice that? The windshield, of course, is much bigger. But there is a rear view mirror. As a church, we'll always look back and thank God for his faithfulness and the shoulders on which we stand today after 175 years. But right now, we're becoming and building the shoulders that people will stand on for our 200th anniversary and our 275th anniversary as we look forward. And we'll always look back. These mirrors are for glancing. But if you try to drive to church staring into the rearview mirror, you're not making it to church. And the same is true for the future God has for us. Let's look through the windshield beyond all that God wants to do, beyond what he's done, beyond what you think can happen. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond everything we ask, think, or imagine according to the power that works in us. I wanna ask you to bow your heads and ponder that for just a moment. What is your windshield? Believers, what is it about yourself? What is it about your past that the enemies throw it in your face? I often call it the religious rooster. He just crowing at you. Cock-a-doodle-doo of condemnation is just screaming at you why God could never use somebody like you. What is it in your past? What is it about yourself that God wants to take this new creation he's building in and through you? What is it that God's teaching you about going beyond? As you ask God that, many of you are here right now or you're watching us and you don't know Jesus and your step beyond is to go beyond death to life. Just this last week, I did a funeral in Fort Wayne of a very dear friend. He's having a great days with Jesus, but that, and we've got a, a really big funeral here in this building, actually in just a matter of hours of a tragedy happened that took place here in our own city. And the brevity of life is a reality we all have to grapple with. We're never promised tomorrow. And it always reminds me of just the urgency of our mission, the urgency of these moments. So as believers are praying, some of you, if you don't know Jesus, you don't know that if you were to die today, you'd spend eternity with him. I wanna invite you to pray something like this from your heart. Just cry it out. Say, Jesus, today I give you me. I know you died for me. I know you rose from the dead. I wanna go beyond my sin, myself, my past. And God, I want to be a new creation. I surrender to you. I make you today Lord of my life. Will you forgive me and save me? 
In your own words, let that be the cry of your heart right now. And the angels in heaven are going to rejoice because every sinner who finds repentance, there's a roar that takes place. And I want to celebrate with you in that in just a moment. Before I do, I want to pray for you as you're all taking those next steps. God, I thank you today for those who have said yes to Jesus in the room, who are watching on screens, those who will hear this. Lord, we thank you for salvation, that you take us beyond our sin, our self, our past, and you give us a future that's way greater than anything we could attain on our own. Today, God, we give you us. And God, I thank you with the angels in heaven for those who have said yes, for the next steps that are being taken. Lord, I pray for those online who are watching. Lord, there's the QR code that's there, a link in the chat, that they'll take that next step, that those who are in the room will find somebody outside these doors in just a few minutes and say, hey, I'm ready to take my next step, or I said yes to Jesus, so that we can go on this journey together. So God, today, I thank you. I praise you. We give you all the honor, all the credit, and all the glory for all the things way beyond what we could ask, think, or imagine. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's thank God for his word today. Let's give Jesus some praise today. Thank him. Welcome people to God's family.